Hey folks, just want to say thank you for joining today. This is Mitch here at IndieSoft. So we do thank you for um, giving us a little bit of your time today to go over a couple of new features that we've been working on and putting in the application. Um, on the call today, we've got myself, Mitch Jones, our sales engineer. We've also got Heather McGraft, our marketing director. Charles Thompson, he's kind of our resident uh, do-all, take-all control. Um, and then we've also got Ben Sykes, one of our senior development uh, staff members. Today's agenda, we're going to be going over our new features that we've put into our Fluke Metcal import utility, and then we're also going to be going over our automated data sync options for field and mobile calibrations. So up first, we're going to have Charles Thompson. He's going to be doing um, an introduction of the new functionality that we've put into the Metcal import utility, which is now compatible with Metcal 8 and 9. It'll run on either the base track or the Met Team platforms. He's also going to be showing the streamlined one screen process that technicians now have. And then we're going to, he's going to close out by showing the new and flexible mapping options to your test points, which will actually put you in a better position and protect you for future upgrades. So as uh, Charles is demoing this functionality, he's going to show you this from a technician's point of view and an administrator's point of view. I'm going to go ahead and pass this over to you, Charles. All right, fantastic. All right, thanks, Mitch, and thanks to all the attendees today for the participation. As mentioned, I'm Charles Thompson. I've been heading up our Metcal import project here for the past few weeks. Uh, we're excited to show you all the work that's been going on, and we're looking forward to getting this latest version in your hands as soon as possible. Uh, very quickly, I just want to reiterate again that if you have questions, go ahead and post those to the, uh, the little question feature there in the webinar, and we'll get those addressed as we go along. All right, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Fluke Results Importer, its purpose is to allow you to leverage your in investment in Fluke automated procedures while still using IndieSoft for asset management, certification, and your other daily business. Uh, to start, we're going to give you a walkthrough of the module and daily practice with a little explanation as we go so you can kind of get a feel for what the various options are. But then uh, we're going to go back into the back end for admins and power users to kind of give you an idea of what all we've added under the hood here. So, uh, so let's get started. All right, so to use the importer with an asset, uh, basically what you're going to do is go to the test points tab and you're going to select Fluke Metcal Procedure as your source for test points. When it's time to work, you're simply going into the calibration event as you always do. Nothing here has changed. And once you get to the data collection screen, you'll click the yellow F icon to launch into the importer. Now, for a technician, we've worked really hard to provide a simple workflow that lets them focus on calibration over configuration. Uh, as Mitch mentioned, we've flattened the interface to one screen, so there's no wizard steps or anything like that. Uh, basically, everything that the technician needs should be right here on this one screen. Now, the support, the uh, importer does support both Metcal 8 and Metcal 9. Uh, on this system, we have both configured, which provides us with two options. The system will adapt itself to your setup, so if you only have Metcal 9 configured, uh, the importer removes all the Metcal 8 items from the interface and vice versa. So if you're on Metcal 8, 9, in transition, whatever the case is, we have you covered any which way you want to go there. Now in the top area, you'll find the criteria for the import using our familiar drill down searches. For instance, I'm pulling uh, IndieSoft here and I'm going to bring up a asset for us. All right. Now I'm selecting these items manually, but if any automation features in the product were set, the system would pre-select the company and asset number and even go ahead and pick the last uh, calibration result for you if desired. There is a button to launch into the Flute Metcal utility, which will then bring up Flute Metcal, just as an example here. And it will bring up a dialogue to let you know that you, know, you should be currently in Fluke. It will be launched. Um, and so if you happen to alt tab back, you can see that, oh, I need to finish up in Fluke before I come back. Uh, once you're done with your Fluke procedure, you're simply going to click this dialogue. But for now, I'm just going to show you the manual process. So we already have our company and our asset. 
and I'm going to pick the most recent calibration for this. There is an option to go ahead and also pick an as left calibration, so we do have still the merging capability of two different Metcal uh, calibrations into one IndieSoft event. There are also some some refresh buttons, so if you're working externally in Fluke Metcal and you have a new a, a new series of events you've added, you can just hit the refresh button and it will just refill the combo box with whatever the latest information is. So once we have this targeted information, all we do is click the import button. And what happens here is all the map test point data is extracted from the database, it's scrubbed of all the blank lines, and then it's run through the new and improved mapping them engine, and then it quickly assembles it in the preview grid here. If any errors occurred in the import, import routine, there is a message viewer that can appear and it can show you all the, any warnings, errors, and so on that have occurred in the import for correction. There is the capability to select rows and delete them, along with resequencing the test points to meet IndieSoft's data requirements. All right, and once the data is ready, it's simply a matter of clicking the transfer button, which then shoots off all the data straight back into IndieSoft. So you can see we have all the data mapped in, and if I step back, you can also see that it has pulled in the, the standard that was used for that calibration event, and it also pulls in your procedure name as well. At that point, just as it is with uh, all other IndieSoft calibration events, it's just a matter of finishing the, the calibration event itself. Obviously, your schedule gets updated, your history gets logged, and you end up with your cert with all of your test point data. Now that entire process is exactly the same for Metcal 8 or Metcal 9. So again, if you're on one version or the other in transition, there's nothing else to have to relearn as you do this. The functionality works the same either way. All right. Now we've gone through just a basic daily use. Uh, we're going to go through some of these setup options. So the database Michael. setup screen, basically this is where you will point uh, to your Metcal 8 database or your Metcal 9 database. We have the capability to refresh your ODBC data sources, uh, to test the data connection, even test to make sure that you're pointed to the runtime as well. The second option gives you the ability to import procedures, standards, um, automatically resequence, you know, take out all those gaps in the import process, uh, set default resolutions, and so on. Then the last option here is the mapping. So this is where all the magic happens. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the system supports multiple versions, but also customizable mapping routines. And it's going to ship pre-configured for most users. Uh, adding a mapping rule is super simple. You just click the Add button. Uh, you'll select the addition if you have multiples uh, that you're using. You will then select the fluke field that you're wanting to pull from. Then you select where you want to point it to in the uh, IndieSoft database if you want to. Now, if you want to, there are also additional advanced options. Uh, there's the ability to do some uh, trimming of strings. We can extract resolutions from different fields. We can take the resolution from one field and map it over to another and so on. So there's lots of flexibility in how we can pull things from the database, convert it over to what's required for IndieSoft uh, with minimal effort. What's important to note here is that we now read the available database columns directly from their sources. What this means is that as additional items or columns are added to your system, uh, so if you add any custom columns to Fluke and so on, the importer automatically picks those up and makes them available to you in your mapping efforts. So there's no recoding on our part required if additional columns or anything like that is added. Along with that, we also allow you to create your own custom, well, you can create your own custom views in the Fluke database, and then you can point our importer to that view instead of the results table and extract the data that way. So you have ultimate flexibility here in how the data gets from Fluke into our product now. And as mentioned, all the standard fields, they're already mapped for you, so 95% of the time you're not even going to have to come into this screen. We've taken a lot of the guesswork out for you, uh, even with just the basic simple mode of adding, you know, move a string from here to there, and so on. Uh, along with that, 
uh, with the release, you're going to find that the manual contains a detailed explanation of this base configuration that we'll ship with, along with any of the requirements that IndieSoft has to make sure that your import is successful. Uh, of course, if the advanced mapping is something you're uncomfortable with, our services group can assist with you on your mapping needs and even any uh, cert redesigns or anything like that to help support the additional columns. Now, uh, I know we have limited time today, and I want to make sure that we transitioned over to all the great sync capabilities that Ben's going to show you. But for anybody who may have come in late or they just want to see how quickly the importer works without this explanation in the middle, I'm just going to walk you through that one more time real quick. All right, so basically we start off with our, our asset on our screen, go into the calibration, we get right to our data point screen, launch into the module, and again, if we didn't have all this, have these options, it would go ahead and pick exactly what we had set up for, set our system up for. Pick our asset, the event, brings in our test points, we transfer, and there they are. All right. So that concludes the overview of the, the Fluke importer today. Uh, I hope everybody is as excited about it as we are, and I'd like to thank you all again for your time. Uh, I look forward to the Q&A segment at the close of the session, uh, answer any questions anyone may have. And uh, with that, I think, Mitch, it's back to you. All right, awesome. Thanks, Charles. I appreciate you doing that. That looks awesome, that new utility. So up next, we're going to have uh, Ben Sykes do a preview of our new automatic offsite calibration um, processes. And But first, I want to give you guys all kind of a background of, of why we're doing this and kind of how we got to this place. Um, so over the last couple of months, we've been listening to our customer bases, and we've kind of come up with four or five things that are really critical to our customers and, and issues that we wanted to solve for them. Um, so, so many of you are familiar with our current single user system where you have to either use the data exchange module or the export import module. And, and there's really just a handful of key things that have made that process cumbersome that we wanted to get rid of and, and make this easier for our customers. So the first issue is we recognize that data exchange module requires a kind of a heavy amount of training for your technicians. So it really requires the techs to have to know fully how to use that particular module. Okay. Um, so what we wanted to create was a function that basically does, it gives the customer, excuse me, the technician, the ability to click one button, select the customer they're going to go see, and then let the software handle the entire process from there. So Ben's going to be showing you that momentarily. Again, that's basically a one button click. You choose your customers you're going to see, and then the software does the rest for you. We've got some new functionality that's being handled behind the scenes automatically. Okay. The second thing that uh, Ben's going to be showing us is we recognize we had some difficulties in getting continual updated information to the, the field laptop or to the field single user, specifically areas like updated calibration procedures, masters or standards that had schedules that needed to be updated. And the multi-user always had, the, the, of course, the most recent due date, but the single users did not. Okay. So um, we wanted to come up with a way where we can be constantly sending information uh, from the multi-user over to the single user immediately as soon as any kind of internet connectivity is detected. So again, it happens automatically behind the scenes. Technicians aren't having to do anything. So that's going to be one of the other features that Ben gives us a tour of. So the third issue that we had um, is we, we, we recognized that the data sync process, it just took a little bit of time, right? It's a massive amount of data we were pushing from the multi-user over to the single user. Um, so we've got a solution now where we can actually have what, what we're going to call a pre-prepared single user database gets created on a weekly basis. And, and when the goal of that is, is this going to create uh, basically a starter database for you that has all of your key configuration, your security profiles, essentially everything that's needed that kind of adds to that data exchange process. So that'll simply just be sitting there come Monday morning or, or Sunday. You actually are in control of the frequency here, but um, we want that to be pre-prepared. So again, the technician comes in, the bulk of the data exchange process is already handled. All they do is click the customers, and then off in the field they go. So that's the third third issue that we addressed with the, the new off-site uh, sync options. Um, and then the, the last one was, is, is we, all, we recognize that technicians get out in the field, they've got items in their single-user laptops and their databases, 
and we need to get it back to the multi-user but we need to get it back as fast as possible right so so we realize that in the current system today you can't really do an invoice you can't get the certificates in the read only or data view browser um, until the technician has pushed the data back into the multi-user so what we've also created is uh, the ability to have that happening behind the scenes immediately as soon as a um, an internet connection is detected and connected. So, so our kind of our primary goals of the new automatic or offsite calibration process is we just want to make it easier. We want to take it out of the technician's hands, let the software do the work. We want to make it faster, more efficient. And again, the, the really the goal was just make it as simple as possible and require a minimum level of technician involvement and just have the software doing the work. So I'm going to go ahead and pass this over to, to Ben Sykes, and um, I appreciate you guys sticking with me during that overview. But Ben's going to show us the technical details and, and what it'll look like from a technician's perspective, and then also the administrative behind-the-scenes options. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to you, Ben, okay? Okay. Hello, guys. My name is Ben Sykes. I'm a developer here at IndieSoft, and we're excited to be able to uh, show you the new sync functionality that we've got in IndieSoft. Make sure I'm visible here. So the new sync functionality, I have a fairly easy job this morning because uh, this is it's fairly easy to demonstrate because we're trying to automate absolutely as much as we can uh, behind the scenes in order to accomplish these syncs. We want to reduce as many steps as possible and, uh, and make sure that this information automatically syncs back and forth uh, between the central database and the single user technician's workstation. So first, let me give you the perspective of just a technician that's about to go out into the field. They're going to make uh, one or two trips this week, and they're going to visit some customer sites. How would they sync that data? And then how would that data get synced back in to the, the central database? This is pretty easy to demonstrate. So uh, in the, the new version of IndieSoft, once it's installed, uh, the only thing you would notice different visually is a new application that's going to run in the system tray on the technician's uh, single user installation. It's just a single user tech sync and it just runs perpetually. When you start up Windows, this is going to be running. Uh, even if you force it close, when you start up uh, the single user main screen, it's going to start this back up just to make sure that everything stays synced. So this utility is what's doing the work behind the scenes. So they come in Monday morning and they're ready to maybe make a one or two trips. So all that they'll need to do is say create new database. And this is reminding them of what they synced uh, last week. So they just select the companies that they're about to visit. Say we're about to visit uh, ABC company. So this utility has a connection back to the central database at this moment because we're, we're not traveling yet. So these are 27 assets from the central database that we want to to sync in to do some work and then we've got various events that are there so then they select the app the company um, multiple companies is fine to select also just each one that you select is going to be added uh, into the grid here and then they press sync so before i press sync you'll notice that the name of this database we're about to create to create is uh is just going to be modeled by the company we're about to visit so we're going to take that, uh, a clone of that database that Mitch mentioned that was created over the weekend that is a grid starter database, and we're just going to bring in everything we need to know uh, about the ABC company and create that database. So then here, here you can see the speed of syncing 21 assets and 27 events or so. So this is, this is a leapfrog in terms of uh, the speed and the type of um, functionality that we're using in order to move this information back and forth. So when that happened, I know that was really quick, but when that happened, we changed, we backed up our current database, we made a connection and copied over the clone database to, to start that was created over the weekend. We brought in those 27 assets for the company that we're about to, to visit. We set our database settings to point to that new database and now it's ready to go. So all of that is just automatic in the system. So now, when the single user technician uh, logs back into the main screen, then they've got all the information that they need uh, for that ABC company. 
So all the assets have been synced in. So now, whenever any work is performed in the single user, let me demonstrate from the technician's perspective how that information gets synced back to the multi-user. So say, say we pull up an asset and we do some work on this. Say we're going to do a repair. So we're out in the field. So out in the field, you may or may not have an internet connection. So what I'm about to, to demonstrate here is going to work fine whether you have an internet or not. So in this case, I have an internet connection. So as soon as this single user, the TechSync utility, notices that something has been modified in the single user database or a new event has been performed, then as this timer is hitting, and let me pull up a quick log here so you can see, then as that log hits, it's going to notice that that asset has changed and export that, and then it's going to upload it uh, to the cloud. This is simply a, a log screen that makes this easier to demonstrate uh, right here. But uh, behind the scenes, they don't have to click on anything. This just automatically, um, automatically occurs. So now, let me give you the perspective uh, from the multi-user database. So just to reiterate, in order to sync any work that's done in single user back to the central database, there's zero operations that zero buttons that need to be pressed uh, it's all simply done automatically so now from the perspective of the central database uh, on one computer there there would be a similar type of sync application that's running it could either run in a, in a system tray or it could be a service or a scheduled task uh, i'll run it just in the system tray to make this uh, easier to demonstrate but normally you wouldn't be running two of these system tray apps. I'm just trying to demonstrate uh, being both sides of this, this handshake. So now this is the sync that's also automatically happening on scheduled intervals uh, against the central database. So here, like it's set up right now to sync every 60 seconds, so it haven't, hasn't synced yet. So now this is connecting back to the same central location in the cloud uh, where these files were uploaded. So here we just noted that we got uh, a piece of equipment that was modified by the technician. It was downloaded uh, from the from the internet and was automatically imported into the multi-user. So here you can see we did the repair uh, 1155. So now if we make a connection into our main screen for multi-user, I know I've got a lot of screens running here, but just pretend now, now we're back in the central lab and this is just a, a view of that database. So this happens to be the same asset I pulled up. So there's the re same repair that uh, we just performed at 11.55. So the sinks are automatic. So that's an example of uh, equipment that's syncing. So now the same type of operation is also going to occur in the opposite direction. So say for multi-user, say you've got uh, during the day at some point, somebody needs to modify uh, one of the masters. So say on this particular scale, the interval needs to change or one of these dates needs to be corrected. So then on this, the timer that we've got for multi-user, then as the next time that this hits, it's going to notice that uh, something has changed and need to be synced back uh, to the other system. And then on the same timer, when uh, it hits the next time, it's going to notice that a master has been modified and it's going to automatically uh, import that asset into the single user workstation. So all of these things are going to happen at the first moment when an internet connection uh, occurs on the single user. So it's, it's totally fine to not have internet for hours at a time, and you continue to assemble work in the single user, and that work is simply, uh, it's exported, and those archive files are ready to be uploaded to the internet. But as soon as you happen to get an internet connection, say you back at your hotel room, you're at Starbucks, and you're checking your email from the day, then 
uh, the new TechSync utility in the tray there will notice as soon as you get an internet connection and start moving those files back. So you've got files that can sync both directions. You can sync uh, equipment and orders uh, from single user back into the multi-user database automatically. And then from the multi-user database back into single user, you can automatically sync uh, any masters that change, any uh, templates, any documents, and any procedures. So say in the multi-user database, you find uh, an updated procedure uh, in your add edits for procedures here. And say this, this third procedure has a new revision and that's something that was not a sync before they went out in the field and it's important uh, for that to be synced. Then anytime there's a new revision, that would update the, uh, we don't need a copy of that, would update this date here for the current revision. Then that's going to be logged to be automatically synced back to the single users. There you go. And so that notification there, Windows is not great with uh, always showing those notifications for long if you click on it. But uh, that's also a preference, whether you want to see any of those notifications. So uh, all of it is basically automatic. So it's easy to demonstrate. So let me show you some of the options that exist. Uh, so now this is more behind the scenes uh, from the perspective uh, of an admin. Let me go to first to the uh, single user sync utility. You might be curious uh, how all this is set up. You make a connection back uh, to the cloud and how do you set up the type of information that is, is synced. That's all done in the user location settings. There's a new tab for tech sync that is in the user location settings. These same options exist uh, in the multi-user, in the central database uh, and in single user. So you get to decide which information is sent automatically back and forth. So if this is a technician out in the field, then typically they would want to be exporting and uploading automatically changes to equipment and orders. And then they would be automatically downloading and importing any changes from the multi-user database to documents, procedures, masters, and templates. So those would be, those checkboxes would be reversed if you were setting up the multi-user uh, the central database. This might seem like a lot of settings here, but keep in mind this is in the user locations dialog. So imagine you have one meeting with one administrator and he pulls up this dialog and the best place to do this would be in your profile manager and pull it up in your global settings and, and then just decide this for all of your technicians at once and then make those settings global. Uh, and so the next time that they log in, they just inherit all these settings. So then you would specify here how you make a connection to your FTP server that would receive these files. Uh, so all these files that are sent back and forth, they're going to be uh, archives that are as small as possible, 256-bit uh, encryption on those files. And then you can specify uh, down here how often you want the sync to occur. Uh, typically, there's all of these syncs are extremely small. So we're only going to sync uh, the archives of, of one asset at a time or one order. Uh, so these syncs can be really frequent and you can stay almost, uh, almost real time in terms of your updates. And then uh, an advanced feature, we won't even get into this today, but uh, there's sync maps that can be used if you want to even get down to the level of, of noting which fields and which details uh, are synced for each asset. There's an extreme level of control that you can use there. But again, when you install the software, it's going to automatically have a sync map ready to go, and you just assign this one time to your technicians, uh, and that's it. So this is where you would point to a common network directory uh, where they would have that starter database that was created on the weekend, and then some quick options for if you want reminder emails whenever an asset or uh, another type of information uh, is synced or uploaded or downloaded. You can even automatically CC a supervisor um, and the emails would go to the email address of the user, the employee that's associated with this uh, particular login. 
And then if you want to turn off uh, the Windows notifications, you can do that also. So that's, those are the only options in terms of setting it up from the, the technician's perspective. And the easiest way to do that would be from Profile Manager, like I said. And then from the central database, the only setup that's involved there is if you go to this computer on, that is, has a connection to the central database, then if you log in as an admin, then they'll see an extra menu item here for uh, set up starter database. So from this screen, and this would only be visible uh, to one admin, uh, you set this up one time at the very beginning of the process. So here you can confirm some options when you're creating the starter database, how you'd like that to be created. And you could press this button to do a manual upload of it as a test. But typically, you're just going to schedule this as a task in Windows. So this is on one server with the, your central database. So you would schedule this probably to run uh, one time on the weekend. So what's going to happen here, this is the, the process that happens on the weekend. So we have a connection at this point to a starter single user database and to the multi-user database. So we're going to take that single user database that already has all of our profiles, our layouts, our flowcharts, everything that we need. We're going to make a copy of that to this particular location. And then at that moment, we're going to delete any equipment and orders that are in that database because we want to start with an empty database so that when the technicians go out into the field, that's the moment we quickly sink in uh, any of the assets they need for their company. And then we're going to import a current slate of templates, documents, procedures, masters, and the history on the masters. So all of that, they have a complete snapshot of that in the weekend. So then at the moment when the technician goes out into the field and they say create new database, like how I, I started the uh, demonstration here. So at that moment, they're going to get a a clean slate of all the assets and orders that they need for the companies that they're about to visit. And we're also going to check to see if there happen to be any templates that have been modified uh, since the weekend, any documents or masters. So we're going to do a much more targeted sync of those templates, documents, and masters. And then the technician goes out into the field. They start using the single user database that they created. And whenever they happen to have an internet connection, any of the masters or documents or templates that are changed real time also come into their database. So that's it. I think that uh, completes any of the options. So if you guys have any last minute questions on this, please make sure to log those. And I think we can move now into uh, answering some questions. All right, great. Thank you, Ben, for uh, for showing us that. That's a, it looks like a fantastic feature, and I think everybody's going to love that. We've we've had a lot of questions come in, and I believe we've been addressing those individually um, as as they were submitted. But there there were a handful that were asked once or multiple times, so I do want to read those out loud and and get the answers out to the group if anyone has any additional questions. So I'm going to start with some questions we came in about the Metcal import tool. Um, so to get started, Charles, I'll let you answer these, but I want to read them out loud for the group. But we had some questions sure. come in about is the is the procedure name um, the Metcal PXE file? Uh, actually, okay, so the PXE is the uh, compiled procedure file. What we're actually doing is we're reading the procedure name from the procedures table, and we're pulling that information in. Okay, excellent. Thank All right. you. All right. We also had a couple questions. Um, so, so for the programs that pass on first run, does as left data automatically populate? And furthermore on that, when the left data is present from the Fluke program, how is it presented in the Indie Soft report? Can you just address that a little bit, please? Oh, yeah. Okay. It's actually the same as it was in our Metcal 8 version. Uh, we read the as left, uh, as found, and left found indicators that are on the database. And if it's a single pass, we will read that. And if it's a left and found, we'll go ahead and automatically copy your as found to your as left for you. Uh, when we do that, we combine them into one line. So the the first pass is going to show in your as found column, and the as left is going to show in the second, but it's still going to be the same test point row number. It won't be two two different row numbers for that. 
Okay. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. Excellent. And then the last question I think we got asked a handful of times is we've got a couple of customers who they're validated and them upgrading to version 11 is not something they can do immediately. So so will the new Metcal import tool still run with version 10 and some of our prior versions or do we have any options there? Uh, it's meant for 11, uh, but, you know, there are customers who have validation uh, issues and cannot upgrade. So, you know, I think that would be one to go through support and let us take a look at it and kind of peel back the layers and see if there's something we can do there. Okay, awesome. So it sounds like we got yep. some avenues for that as well. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Well, excellent. Great. Well, I think that covers kind of the primary questions that I saw with consistency come in related to the Metcal import tool. So I, um, I've had a few come in related to the, the new yeah. sync options as well. So Ben, I'm going to let you answer a couple of those. Um, so one of the ones that we saw come in is when those single user okay. databases are created, are those deleted automatically once you're connected back to the main database? Uh, no, currently they're not automatically deleted. Uh, it would be easy to add in uh, some archive kind of functionality on that, but uh, currently the, the plan is to have those databases as small as possible. So they're going to have just a, a current copy of your layouts and your flowcharts and your workflow that you need, and then you're going to bring in adjust the assets uh, that you need uh, to perform that work. So it's it's never really going to grow that big in size. And so uh, it would be nice to have an archive of that. So I, I would think the, the best policy might be to make a backup of these somewhere, uh, just in case that they're ever needed. Um, but it's not uh, something you're going to have to worry about losing once that once you come in and create the next next database for the next week. Okay, excellent, excellent. And, and another question I saw a couple of folks ask Ben is, is can you describe or explain kind of what happens when the sync doesn't get completed because the internet connection is lost or disconnected? Yes, that's that will happen from time to time. So the way, think of it like uh, like a print queue. It's very similar, like you've got an, an indie print, print queue. So we're logging uh, certain jobs that need to be done uh, to the database, just like an inst instruction list. So the first list of instructions would be, uh, I notice this technician has modified these three assets and they've done some events, so let's do an export of these and send it back. That operation of creating the archive for those assets, that has to complete and be validated before the next instruction is listed to the queue. So the next instruction would be, now that we have that archive, let's upload it to the cloud. So then that each one of those uploads has to complete and be validated without any errors in order for that operation to be removed from the queue. So say the archive was ready to be uploaded to the cloud and it got halfway there, but then we get a response that the, the upload was not complete or you lost internet connection, then it's fine. It's just going to make a note of that in the log but that operation is still going to be part of the queue. The next time the timer comes around, it's just going to keep trying to push that file up. Okay, excellent. So one more I want to throw your way, Ben, is, um, and I know we kind of talked about this, but can you explain a little bit further or a recap when a technician's in the field and they need to create new equipment and new assets? Historically, we've always allowed that. But now with our new process, we're going to have templates, updated templates, procedures, standards getting pushed back down to the single user automatically. So when a technician does have to create a new asset in the field, they will be able to push that back to the multi-user the exact same way. Is that correct? That's correct. So creating a new asset is, is just like any other change that you would make to that asset. Okay, excellent. Well, there are a couple of questions I think we've addressed all the ones that kind of came in with, in, I guess, in uh, multiple instances or, or ways of asking the same question. We want to cover those for the entire group. Um, so we're going to go ahead and, and, and lean towards closing out the webinar today. I do want to say I thank you all for your time. I also want to let you know if there were any specific questions that were not addressed or kind of had any ambiguity out there. I'm going to be reaching out to each customer who joined if there are any additional open questions. Um, so myself or Heather or somebody on our team will be in touch with you. Um, again, I appreciate everybody dialing in with us today. Appreciate your time. And um, if there's anything we can ever do for you, please let us know. All right. Thank you all, and you have a wonderful day.